All right, yes. Okay, great. So it's my pleasure um, to uh, welcome back um, James Paskeleff, who will continue his introduction um, to Fukai. Thank you very much. All right, um, is everybody, uh, is all visible? Yes. Slides. Okay, so great. So thank you very much. Yeah, so um, I'm just going to today um, try to really give the an introduction to the Fukai category specifically. So last time we talked about some symplectic geometry basics. Um, a lot of that stuff will come up in this talk. Um, and the third lecture I had planned would be some examples or some example ways of computing the Fukai category. As it happened, this lecture, as I was preparing it, got kind of long. So I suspect we will not finish all of the slides today. So I'll, some of this might um, spill over onto Monday. Um, and well, it's because the Fukai category has a lot of different um, issues that go into defining it. And I'm not going to be able to give a complete um, explanation of every single issue um, in the most general cases, but I will try to touch on every issue that comes up, um, maybe very briefly, but I will try to touch on every issue that comes up in the definition of the Fukai category of a symplectic manifold. Okay. So, but the main focus of this lecture will be on, you know, understanding really the underlying geometry that the concept of the Fukai category emerges from. Okay, so let's go to the overview. So um, we'll talk a bit about holomorphic maps. That's the basic geometry that goes into the definition of the Fukai category. Um, we'll talk about a, a way of understanding moduli spaces of holomorphic maps called the Gromov compactification. Um, then I'll try to define Fleur cohomology, um, which are the morphism complexes in the Fukai category. And then I'll try to explain how the A infinity operations are defined. And then in the last section, I'll try to explain in some detail two of the two issues that I think are quite tricky, um, especially if you've never seen this sort of thing before, um, which are the gradings on the Fukai category and the orientations on the moduli spaces. Well, as I said, that bit might actually have to wait till Monday, but let's try to proceed. Okay, so last time I, the end of last lecture, I talked a bit about the problem of Lagrangian intersections. If you have a symplectic manifold and you have some Lagrangian submanifolds, you can try to intersect them and you can try to construct invariants that way. So intersection numbers. And I said that this Fukai category, one thing it can do is it can be thought of as a categorification of that problem. So instead of having two Lagrange two objects and you intersect them and you get a number. If you take two Lagrange's, you intersect them and you get a vector space um, whose uh, graded dimension is the intersection number, uh, possibly up to a sign that depends on the dimension. But okay, essentially it's the intersection number. And the idea is that this categorification comes from some geometry that you can at least attempt to apply anytime you have a Lagrangian intersection problem. Now, there will be a number of caveats to that, as it will be explained in this lecture, but that's the basic idea. Um, and the basic kind of construction is, well, what is the morphism complex between two transversely intersecting oriented Lagrangians? It's, the, it's basically the vector space spanned by their intersection points. So you just build a vector space whose basis are the intersection points. And now the operations on this, like the A-infinity operations, are going to be maps between vector spaces that look like this, and what I'd like to say is that, you know, you have some inputs, which are intersection points of Lagrangians. You have an output, which is an intersection point of Lagrangians. And the map that you're getting, this operation is going to count some, it's going to be associated with some kind of process that connects the input intersection points to the output intersection points. And that's what we are going to spend most of this uh, lecture talking about. So the basic process is um, something called a holomorphic map. So just to recall, as some of this has been set up in the previous lecture. So we take a symplectic manifold M omega, we equip it with a compatible almost complex structure J. So that means that the tangent bundle of M is a complex vector bundle. Um, it's compatible with omega. That's gonna be important in some of the uh, arguments we have later. It means that um, to get that J and omega can be combined to give a Riemannian metric, a symmetric positive definite metric. Okay, and that M omega or M omega J, um, you know, that triple is really the target for our holomorphic maps. So the domain of a holomorphic map is just gonna be a Riemann surface. Um, I'll call it sigma. 
and I'll say small j is the um, complex structure on the domain. So a Riemann surface, you know, it's as charts. I mean, classically, it's defined by charts, which are open sets in C. Um, but of course, it can also be interpreted as an almost complex manifold, just, just two-dimensional, where the j is the multiplication by i in the tangent space. OK, then when you have this setup, you can talk about a holomorphic map. So what is the definition of a holomorphic map? It says that the differential of the map is complex linear. So if u from sigma to m is a map, um, you look at du, that's the differential of u. And if that map is complex linear, so it commutes with the complex structures, then we call that a holomorphic map. Um, and we sometimes call that the, the cauchy riemann equation. Of course, it's a generalization of the classical cauchy riemann equation, but we just give it the same name. Um, maybe to orient you, if you've never thought about this before, if, um, if J is an integrable complex structure, then this is the same thing as just a map between complex manifolds. So I didn't really talk about integrability. Um, integrability is basically the condition that the, that the manifold M comma capital J actually has holomorphic local coordinate systems. Um, that's actually not true uh, in general. Uh, for an almost complex manifold. That's the reason why the adjective almost is present in the name. Um, I can talk more about, you know, how that all works, but just it's so, you know, these things are, are somewhat more general than actual, you know, holomorphic maps. Okay, and if, um, so another thing to point out is that if you have a Riemann surface with boundary, so if sigma has a boundary, like maybe it's a disk or it's a, you know, another surface with boundary. Um, the natural thing to do is actually to require that U um, restricts, uh, that U maps the boundary to uh, a, a given Lagrangian submanifold. That's kind of a natural boundary condition um, for um, Lagrange, for uh, this holomorphic map equation. But by the way, I mean, you know, it, it's kind of like, this cauchy riemann equation is a partial differential equation. So the boundary conditions you impose have to make sense. So uh, just like if you have, say, you know, Poisson equation or Laplace equation, you usually use Dirichlet boundary conditions or Neumann boundary conditions. If you use, you know, if you have a hyperbolic partial differential equation, you'll talk about Cauchy boundary conditions. You know, the point is that Lagrangian boundary conditions are the good boundary conditions for the holomorphic maps, the, the analog of Dirichlet boundary conditions for Laplace's equation. Okay, so they're a good boundary condition. And the justification of that is, you know, the analysis of this partial differential equation, but we'll just take that as, as our starting point. Okay, uh, yeah, let's just go straight to an example, okay? So let's just do an example. So I'm going to take M to be C. So actually now the this is, might be a little bit funny. The target space is just the complex plane, okay? And well, you know, Lagrangians in the plane are just any kind of curves, any kind of one, any kind of curve. So maybe I could take something like this. Maybe I'll take a bunch of lines, okay? So I'll just take a bunch of lines that form a polygon, okay? And now what I'm gonna ask is, okay, what are holomorphic maps with boundary on this polygon? Okay, that's that's maybe uh, uh, you know a, a question you could ask. Well, okay, everything here is actually classical because the complex structure is integrable now. So this is just single variable complex analysis, um, and this is actually um, a very classically studied problem. So let P be a polygon in the plane, so like this. Um, now, so I'll say let's say it has angles. So the interior angles are pi times alpha k where uh, alpha k is uh, you know, between zero and two. Okay, so it's like, here's vertex one, pi alpha one is the interior angle there, uh, et cetera. Well, now you may know that the, okay, the interior of this polygon is some domain in C and it's simply connected and it's not all of, uh, all of C. So the Riemann mapping theorem says that the interior of the polygon is biholomorphic to the interior of the unit disk. Okay, so that's the Riemann mapping theorem. Um, well, actually, people studied, you know, well, what is that map? Like, it's pretty geometric. Like, here's a polygon. What's the map from the disk to the interior of the polygon whose existence is guaranteed by the Riemann mapping theorem? And actually, there's a formula for it. 
um, which is this thing called Schwartz Christoffel formula. That's at the bottom of this slide. And it says, it's actually very nice. Um, by the way, you can, for example, find this formula in um, the complex analysis textbook by Lars Alfors. Um, so it's very classical. Basically it says that the fun if you look at the function that maps the disk to the interior of the polygon, it has this form, it's f of w, so w is in the domain, f of w is the integral of the product of these factors. So it's the product of w minus wk to the alpha k minus one dw. And this c and c prime are just uh, complex constants. So basically c and c prime are like scaling and uh, shifting in the complex plane. But basically the structure of the function is this, this uh, it's the integral of this expression right here which kind of looks like a polynomial, except it's not a polynomial because the numbers alpha k are real numbers. So this exponent alpha k minus one is actually a number between negative one and one. Um, so, you know, okay. So that's the formula. Um, but maybe I should explain one thing about this. Maybe it's, so there's these numbers w k, which appear here. Um, so the numbers WK, those are implicit. So the numbers WK are implicitly defined by this formula. So I'm saying that the, the map has a certain structure. There are certain points WK on the boundary of the disk such that the function has this form. So that's actually interesting. It means that the shape of this polygon is somehow determined by the numbers alpha K and also the, the positions of these points on the boundary of the disk, okay? In fact, maybe it's, I hope it's clear. The points, these points on the boundary of the disk, this W1, W2, et cetera, those are the points that map to the vertices of the polygon, okay? Um, so, you know, somehow as you change the shape of this polygon, like maybe you change some of the lengths, you change some of the angles, these, these points will sort of move along the boundary of the disk um, in order to make this formula uh, true, okay? So that's good. Yeah, let's see, are there questions about this? I know this is like, this. let's see, where is my, oh, no, nope, no, nope, that's not what I wanted to do. Oh, okay, here, I'm looking in the chat. Uh, no questions so far. Okay. All right. So, right. So actually, I would say, you know, you can get surprisingly far in this uh, holomorphic curve business by understanding this example really well. I mean, you can see a lot of the phenomena in the holomorphic curve theory just by looking at, you know, polygons in the plane. So I'm actually going so this will be actually a big source of examples in this talk. So that's why I introduced this. Okay, but in particular, it's, there's some comments about this formula. So if you have a vertex of the polygon where alpha K is not in Z, uh, where it's not an integer, well, so, well, okay, where alpha K is not one is the main thing. If alpha K is one, then there's not really a vertex there. It's like a 180 degree angle. So you could kind of drop that. Um, the point is that this integrand has a branch point singularity um, because you have to take um, W minus WK raised to a real number power, um, which so there's, there's a, there's a branching phenomenon there. Um, of course, the domain is simply connected, so you can always choose a branch of this integrand. That's not a problem. Um, and different branches can be absorbed into the constant C and C prime. But um, okay, so what that means is actually this formula does have a singularity at the points WK. Okay, um, so the, this formula does not really define a continuous function, a smooth function all the way up to the point WK in the domain. Um, but it does define a smooth function up to the other points on the boundary. So what we like to think is to, in this analysis, we think that there's the domain WK, uh, sorry, there's this domain disk, and we actually remove the points WK from the boundary. So it's what's called, so that gives us what's called a boundary punctured disk. So we think that really that's the domain for this thing. It's a disk with a bunch of points on the boundary removed, and we call that a boundary punctured disk. Okay, so those are actually gonna be the domains of those, those, those are the domains of the holomorphic maps that define the Foucault category, by the way. So these boundary punctured disks. Um, next thing to note is that um, 
boundary, you know, I said that somehow the shape of the polygon has to do with the positions of the points on the boundary, these boundary punctures now, but um, of course, different configurations can be equivalent. And the reason is because the disk has an automorphism group, which is PSL2R, um, the Mobius transformations. So what you should really think is you quotient by that. That's the sort of possible domains is uh, the, the, the config, it's the configurations of a certain number of points on the boundary of the disk modulo the action of the Mobius transformations. And we call that the moduli space Rn. So if there's n marked points on the boundary, Rn. Um, the, and those are going to be, again, our domains for our problems in the Fukai category. So the dimension of Rn is n minus 3, um, because PSL2R has three dimensions. These are real dimensions, of course. This is, um, you know, this space is not a, this moduli space is not a complex manifold. It's only a real manifold. Um, R3 is a point. Um, so I'm saying if you have three distinct points on the boundary, there's a unique Mobius transformation that can take them to a given position. We also sometimes need, this is a little bit um, funny. We also sometimes need to consider domains that have fewer than three marked points. So if the domain has fewer than three boundary punctures, um, then that domain actually has a, a positive dimensional automorphism group. Um, we often call that the unstable situation. So we will need to consider those at times. Okay, so you can think that the space of, you know, if you have only two points on the boundary, of course, that can't really appear for a polygon in the plane, but uh, we think of that's like a point mod R, that the domain, when you have two points on the boundary, there's an R symmetry. Um, okay, let's see, any questions here? Sorry, whoops. Okay, sorry. Yes, I think there is a chat, a question in the chat. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, we got the, the notes. Okay. Um, let's just go ahead. Okay. So what is a holomorphic polygon in a symplectic manifold? Let's go back to that setting. So I have M is a symplectic manifold with an almost complex structure J. Um, and I have a bunch of Lagrangians. So let's do that. So let's say I have... Um, N plus one Lagrangians, L0 through Ln, they meet transversely at intersection points Xi, um, which is the intersection between Li minus one and Li, and X0 will be an intersection point between the last one and the first one. So it's kind of a cyclic, it's like a cyclic sequence of intersection points. So you go from L0 to L1, L1 to L2, L2 to L3, et cetera, up to Ln, and then L0, Ln back to L0. And then we take a domain, which is a disk with N plus one boundary punctures. Okay, and then a holomorphic polygon in M with the with these boundary data. So the the boundary uh, conditions are the LIs, and then these uh, sort of puncture conditions are the XIs. Those intersection points. Um, that's going to be a map from the interior. So it's going to be a map from the disk minus those boundary punctures to M, with the property that it's holomorphic on the interior of the domain. So holomorphic in that sense of that Cauchy-Riemann equation on the first slide. The differential commutes with J. Um, it also has the property that, the, so if you take the limit um, of the map as you approach one of the boundary punctures, then you approach in the target the corresponding intersection point. And also it has to satisfy the boundary condition. So between two of the boundary punctures, that whole segment should be mapped to uh, the corresponding Lagrangian. Okay. So that's called a holomorphic polygon in M. So it's just, um, just maybe to show you a picture, it's exactly like this picture. It's just that you interpret these things. Well, these straight lines, they're not really meant to represent now a polygon in the plane. They're just some Lagrangians in some symplectic manifold, but the whole thing, you know, this is how the boundary conditions fit together. It's exactly like this. Okay. Those are my holomorphic polygons. Okay, and that's the fundamental thing we're going to study. So we're going to try to build a infinity category out of these things. Um, and that's going to introduce some issues. Um, but, you know, everything's about, you know, making this work. This is the goal. Okay. 
All right, so yeah, right. So the question is, so I've introduced these polygons. I said, these are somehow the answer, but okay, what are you supposed to do with these things? Well, you know, what you wanna do is, what we ultimately say is we wanna count them, that, you know, somehow we, we, we just count the number of polygons. That's, that's the slogan that we repeat over and over. We wanna count the number of polygons. But that raises a lot of questions. So for example, if you had the fixed boundary conditions, um, like let's just say you fix the LIs and the XIs, just, we're just looking at one situation. Are there finitely many? Well, um, well, I mean, that kind of depends. So you have to understand what it depends on. So in general, um, you, you do expect, um, basically this partial differential equation, this cauchy riemann equation is an elliptic equation. So you, you do actually expect to have finite dimensional spaces of solutions. Um, so, so, so maybe there's not finitely many, but you do at least expect there to be finite dimensional spaces. Okay. Um, are those spaces compact? Well, no, generally. So that's going to be an issue. Um, are they actually, are the solution spaces manifolds? That's actually a very tricky issue, which I'm not going to say anything about in this lecture, but um, you do have to do something with these partial differential equations to show, that, to understand when the solution is actually a manifold. So the word we use for that is transversality um, of the moduli space. Is the moduli space transversely cut out by the defining equation? That is a, um, a very challenging problem to understand in general. Um, and there's multiple solutions. I mean, in some situations, you often just assume a hypothesis that makes it work, um, or you have to work with um, some kind of virtual chain technique. Um, and there's multiple technologies that could be used for that. Okay, going back to Kaya O, um, Hofer, uh, Vizoski, Zander, um, John Pardon has an approach. I mean, there's multiple approaches for this. Okay. Um, okay, well, let's suppose we do that. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say about that issue. <laughs> okay, let's just suppose that works. Well, then we also still need to understand, well, I said it's finite dimensional, but it's not a finite set. What am I supposed to do if it's, well, you have, what you have to do is understand when it's a finite set. That actually will come in um, in the last section of these, this lecture where we talk about gradings and orientations, that's, we'll have, there's a way to understand a priori whether you're gonna expect a finite set of solutions. Okay. Now, another issue is, do we need to count with signs? Because, you know, like with intersection numbers, you have, you count the intersections, but there's a sign associated to each one. So probably that's gonna come up too, and it does. Um, and that's also in the last section of this lecture. There are some signs, they're not actually that easy to explain, but I, I will give um, you know a, an attempt to explain them. Okay, so you need to understand are there finitely many? You need to understand what the signs will be. Okay, but supposing you could solve those problems, you know how are you ever going to get an A infinity category out of this? Well, you need to understand what kind of structure there is in this collection of numbers because you know suppose I said oh here's a situation where there's finitely many I count them with signs. Well, I get a bunch of numbers. But you know what good is that set of numbers? I mean, if there's no structure, it's just it's just a bunch of numbers. Um, but there is a there is a structure um, that leads to um, something interesting. So there's actually relations between these numbers, and these relations come from allowing the domain of your Riemann surfaces to degenerate or allowing the curve to degenerate in certain ways. Um, that goes by the name Gromov compactification, and in fact when you see what kind of Gromov, what the Gromov compactification does, when you understand the combinatorics um, that governs those possible degenerations, you see that you get an A infinity category. I mean, that's the great thing. That's what Fukaya, you know, discovered that is the reason why his name is on this subject. Okay. Okay, let's see here. Okay. Trying to check my, let's see, did we get another chat question? Is Li cap Lj empty if J is not I or I, I plus one or I minus one? Um, no, no, no. The point is you, um, I'm not saying that's the question I think about this slide here. No, I'm just saying 
So what I'm describing here is I'm describing, um, you know, what is a holomorphic polygon? I'm describing actually, you know, a, a whole class of problems. So given Lagrangians and given intersection points, find the holomorphic maps with those the boundary data. But I could take the same Lagrangians in a different order, look at different intersection points, and then I would have another problem. So, you know, the point is that um, the LIs and XIs are just given things, but there could be other things that one could also consider. It, it, I mean, the definition of a chi category, we have to consider all possibilities in the end. So I'm going to consider every possible collection of boundary data that, you know, looks like this by the end. There's no assumption that anything else that this is, there's no assumption that these are the only intersection points. There's tons of others, but for, for each you uh, consider this. Okay, let's just do a Gromov compactification. Let's, let's jump straight in. So what is happening? Well, so I'm gonna go back to that polygon case. So here's um, a polygon in the plane. So back to the context of that schwartz christoffel formula. So here's a polygon in the plane. It's, um, it's meant to be this, um, it's actually a quadrilateral, right? Um, so the interior angles, so it has a, so there's four vertices, one, two, three, four. So the, so the angles at one, two, and four are less than pi, whereas the angle at three is greater than pi. Well, okay, whatever, it's a quadrilateral. Um, we can think about, you know, the uniformization via Riemann mapping theorem. So there's some disk, there's some map from the disk with four boundary punctures that maps to this quadrilateral, okay? Now, I can think of this as an instance of this Lagrangian boundary conditions problem because I just say, well, look, these lines, if I take the edges and I just extend them, if I extend those edges to, you know, infinite lines in C, those are Lagrangians. Those are Lagrangian submanifolds of C, so great. So I have here four Lagrangians, these four lines, and I have a polygon with boundary on these four lines. Great. Well, um, is this the only polygon that satisfies these boundary conditions? Is it the only one? Well, here's the thing. <laughs> the thing is the, the problem is slightly formulated slightly differently because all I want is I want the boundary of the disk to map to these Lagrangians. So something that can happen, this is kind of, and this is an important thing, is that there's a different, there are, there is actually a different polygon um, with boundary on these Lagrangians. And it looks like this. There's actually a, a, there's actually a continuous family of polygons with boundary on these Lagrangians. So it looks like this. The boundary of the, poly, the disk, it kind of traces along one edge from one to two. Then it traces, then it switches to the other Lagrangian at two. It goes along the other Lagrangian to three. It switches to the next Lagrangian at three. And then it goes down a little bit. Then it decides to turn around and go back up to four. And then it comes down back to one. And so this is, um, uh, so that's actually another map with, that satisfies the boundary conditions. So the image of the interior is not the same. So in, in the context of the Riemann mapping theorem, this is a different domain because right, the interior of the disk maps to something different. Here in the first picture, the top row, the interior of the disk maps to this whole quadrilateral. Whereas if, if you think about what's happening in this second picture, the interior of the disk maps to the quadrilateral minus a slit. So that's something you can do in general is, you know, um, if you take a domain in CN, in C, sorry, and you, and you cut a slit in it, that's still a simply connected domain. So the Riemann mapping theorem still applies. So, you know, there's another map there. Okay. So that's what I say, I call this thing a slit. Um, so at a non-convex corner, which is like three, a slit can form. Now this slit, so, you know, it starts here. You know, the slit starts to form. That's a, that's a deformation of the map, still satisfying the boundary conditions. But eventually that slit can grow and it could grow so large that it, that it cuts the polygon into two. So, it, so eventually it will break this quadrilateral into two triangles. Okay, so that's this third picture here. So there's another, there's a new boundary point, which I'm calling N, N stands for node. Um, and that is the sort of the final configuration. If you let the slit grow, it eventually breaks out completely. 
into two triangles. So the picture here is there's actually two triangles. One triangle is um, the triangle whose corners are n, two, and three. And the other triangle is the triangle whose corners are n, one, and four. Um, good. Now, you can also think about what is happening in the domain. So I remember I said you apply uniformization, I mean, Riemann mapping theorem. Well, here, you know, the domain is, um, you know, some, some disk with four boundary points removed. Well, as this slit forms, remember this schwartz christoffel formula, it actually tells you, by the way, in the context of the schwartz christoffel formula, this middle configuration, there's actually another vertex whose alpha is equal to two. Um, but since alpha is equal to two, it, there's not actually a, it's not actually a branch point. Um, it's like holomorphic there. Uh -huh. There's no singularity. Okay, so, but if you think about what's happening in these domains, um, what's actually happening is that the points two and three are, are coming closer together. So I can think that one and four are staying in the same place, but two and three are coming closer together, okay? Um, alternatively, because of the action of Mobius transformations, it's the same thing if you think of two and three as staying the same and one and four coming together. That's a little bit confusing, but I mean, I'm just saying it one way. Okay, so one way this could work is one and four stay apart, two and three come together. And then when you reach the degenerate configuration, what's actually happened is that two and three have collided. Um, w2 and W3 have collided on the boundary of the disk. And the way we visualize that is um, this way we say that, well, actually, okay, two and three, from the point of view of one and four, points two and three have come together, but they're basically at, sitting at this point WN, but then from, you know, the other point of view, these points two and three, um, you know, sort of are sitting on a new component of the domain. So this strategy, um, if you're familiar with the deline mumford compactification of the Montelay space of marked Riemann surfaces, that's what we're doing here. So this is a deline mumford type compactification of this space of domains. Okay, let's see here. Let's see, are there any questions? Okay, here, no, I don't think so. Okay, great. All right, so that's a type of, this is an example of, of how you compactify the space of polygons. Okay, so when you have a polygon, sometimes it can move in a one dimensional family or a higher dimensional family. And then we're gonna wanna include these degenerate configurations that arise as the limit. Okay, okay so, right. So, so the, so the basic idea is, yeah, you want to include these things. Okay, these degenerate configurations. Um, so another degeneration that can happen is what I call Fleur breaking or strip breaking. So it's kind of the same phenomenon. It's just that, well, um, you know, in a general symplectic manifold, the lines aren't really straight. So you, you have to consider things like this. So here I have one curve, which loops back around. And then I have two that are like in the previous picture. And here I have a triangle. So it has uh, points one, two, and three. So, so again, the way this map works is it's like, this map does have a slit in it. So it's like you go around one up to two, you switch over, you go down, and then you decide to turn around and go back up to three, and then you come back to one. And in fact, this domain, here the domain is always the same. Um, that's funny because, um, you know, up to the action of Mervis transformations, you can always take these three points to the same positions, okay? So this is actually just a family of different maps where um, the points in the, in the domain, where the domains are all the same, up to formal equivalence. However, if you think about what's happening here, um, as the slit grows, it's eventually gonna break into this configuration. So what I have here is I have a triangle, one N and three, and then I have a, what I'll call a bygone, so, or strip is another name, um, that joins N to two. And the picture of that domain is like this. So I have, um, so I sort of have this new component um, that connects point two to the node. And then there's this component that connects the node to, two and, to one and three. Okay. So that's another degeneration that can happen. This type of degeneration, um, how to say, something that's strange, somewhat strange is happening here because the actual conformal structure of the domain, so the complex structure on the domain 
is not changing up to isomorphism. Um, but nevertheless, um, there's something interesting happens in the limit because the map, you know, something is happening to the map. The map is really changing and the, the map really changes its topology, even though the domain doesn't really change its complex structure in this process. Okay. So this is also something we're going to have to throw in when we take the when we try to compactify the space of maps. Okay, now there's even more that can happen. So you do have to consider all the possible degenerations. So it's also possible that what breaks off is a disk. So unfortunately, I was not able to figure out. A, unfortunately, I think in the plane, all of the pictures look somewhat degenerate when this happens. But what's happening here is there's a map from a disk with two boundary marked points, boundary punctures, to this picture. And both of the uh, boundary punctures are getting mapped to the same point here. But you know, there's a moduli space of these maps where somehow you go around the boundary and then you're allowed to sort of form a slit along the second Lagrangian here. And you're able to do this. This slit can grow. Well, it could grow and split this thing into two bygones. That's one thing that could happen. But it can also shrink. So this is kind of a funny situation. It's possible for this slit to shrink. And what you actually get is a broken configuration that looks like this, where you just have, so here the node actually sits at exactly the same point as the other two corners. Um, and what you have here is you have this, this uh, the domain. We think of this as, a, in the Gromov compactification, we think of this as a, the generation where the domain has two components. One of them has three boundary punctures. One of them has one boundary puncture. Um, and actually there's this sort of disc here with one boundary puncture. That disc actually maps to the whole disc here. And then this disc with three boundary punctures, it actually maps via the constant map just to this point. So that's, it's, it's a degenerate configuration somewhat, um, but you know, this is another thing that can happen. Okay. So, you know, I would say these are the kind of the, the main degenerations you have to consider when you form the Gromov compactification of the moduli space of polygons with fixed boundary conditions. And wh which degenerations can occur depends on exactly which boundary conditions you pick, but you know, you have to, we're thinking about the whole system, like how does it all fit together? So you have to consider all of these things. So the main things are a polygon breaking into smaller polygons, um, where you're allowed to where you're allowed to break off a, a two gon. I mean that's not really a polygon in the classical sense, but it's like it's in in a symplectic manifold you can have bigons which have two vertices and two edges, or you can even have whatever one gons. You know it's like a polygon with one vertex and one edge that, that can also happen. Um, okay, and if you put all of these things together. Okay, let's just do that. So you put all of these different degenerations together, you're getting something we call the Gromov compactification of the moduli space of maps, or it's also called the moduli space of stable maps. Okay, um, where stable maps has to do with, that, that terminology comes from the Deline Mumford space. But um, so, you know, you, you, you basically consider all, not just polygons, but also these degenerate configurations and you throw them all in and you get some big moduli space. And this moduli space has many different components. Um, okay, it's just, I'm just setting up the problem. Okay, let's see other questions so far. Because this is a key thing, let's see. Is it only an analogy with stable curves are there, or are there results making the bridge? Well, um, let's see. So it depends on what exact definition you wanna talk about. So. You know, there's different constructions of the moduli space of stable curves in algebraic geometry. I suppose that's what you're referring to. So in algebraic geometry, there's multiple ways to construct the moduli space of stable curves. Um, I guess Deline used, I mean, not Deline, Mumford <laughs> used um, geometric invariant theory. Um, but this would be more like, um, how to say, more like the Teichmuller theory of, well, maybe it's not more like the Teichmuller theory approach. What I would say is that there is, there are constructions, let me put it this way. How to say, I don't know how to construct moduli spaces of 
polygons using geometric invariant theory because they're not algebraic objects. I mean, they have real boundary, they're basically real boundary conditions. Like you would need to understand the real structure somehow. Um, but there are ways to construct the moduli space of stable curves, the Dele Mumford moduli space using the techniques that are used here. So that's the one way to think about it. So in, in principle, this, this you know, holomorphic curve theory has developed to such an extent that we can independently construct the Deline Mumford moduli space using the techniques used here. <laughs> so yeah. So in fact, the Deline Mumford moduli space, you know, is an example of these moduli spaces. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. By the way, for those of you who maybe don't know, Deline Mumford moduli space is just when the Riemann surface is a compact Riemann surface doesn't have any boundary. Um, okay, so yeah, so actually we got to think about what are all the possible domains. And I think here we're going to see something pretty cool. So if you think about all the possible domains, I guess I'm really going back to, just let me skip back this slide where I have a four gon breaking into three gons, or I have a, you know, an n gon breaking into smaller polygons. If you think about what happens on the domain in those situations, um, and you think about all the possibilities, you get some interesting pictures. So I guess here I've indexed, I think I changed the indexing slightly. So um, the index, what am I doing here? Now I have disks with D plus one boundary punctures and I'm distinguishing one of them, which I'll call the root. And then you look at all the possible degenerations. So you sort of distinguish one of the boundary punctures and you say, that's the root. I'm just gonna keep that one fixed. And then you look at the way all the other, you look at the configurations of the other D punctures. So you look at these other D punctures, WK for K running from one to D. And what happens is it's this phenomenon that the punctures kind of, they collide with each other. Okay, they might collide with each other. But if they collide with each other, we sort of sprout a new component and then the, they, you know, we just sort of keep them apart. Okay. So you think about what are all these possible degenerations? Well, look at it this way. If once you fix, um, once you fix one of the points, the other D points, they're on an arc, okay? And then as they, you're sort of grouping points on an arc. But if you think about grouping points on an arc and you think about all the possible groupings, that's the same as partial parentheses of D letters. You know, another way of saying it is that if you have D symbols, on a lot, you know, just in a, on a page and you put in parentheses to group them, you get a bunch of different um, parentheses. Okay. But of course, these different parentheses, those are also, um, you know, there's also these trees, these rooted trees that, um, you know, Keller was talking about. That's, that's also combinatorially in bijection with that. So what you actually get is that the compactification of the um, moduli space of boundary punctured disks is the associahedron, at least as combinatorial. So it's a manifold with boundary and corners. Um, and so this, that's how the associahedron appears in this theory. So here's an example. So I said R3 is a point. So if you have three points on the boundary, you can always use a Mobius transformation to take them to a preferred position. So R3 is a point and R3 bar is just a point. What about R4? Now I have four points on the boundary of the disk. Um, by a Mobius transformation, I can take three of them to a preferred, preferred position, but the fourth one will be allowed to move. And here's what it looks like. So here's sort of the generic configuration where you have four points. Well, sort of, you know, two of them can come together like this, or two of them can, or the other two can come together. And so that gives me an interval. So R4 bar is an interval. And then R5 bar is a pentagon, um, because while well, generically I have, you know, five points that are just separate, but then, you know, along these edges, um, some of them can come together. Um, the vertex is a further degeneration where it's like, uh, well, anyway, here it is. I mean, here's the picture. Contemplate this picture. Um, and you can, of course, draw it in higher dimensions. But, you know, the way it goes is, you, is different rejections. You say, well, the strata here are just groupings of these, you know, other punctures. That's the same as partial parentheses of a word or it's the same as a rooted tree, you know, they're all, they're just, they're just the same. Okay. So, you know, 
There you go. So, right. So this slide is the reason why uh, the Fukai category is an A infinity category, because you look at this thing and you see the associohedron. I mean, that's that's the explanation. Okay. All right, let's see here. Okay, um, and then let's talk about the compactification of the space of maps. All right, so yeah, I think I'm doing fine. So maybe I, I, I've sort of said this in words, but the idea is, again, just to review what we're gonna do with this, you take a bunch of Lagrangians, L0 through LD, so you take D plus one Lagrangians, and then you choose intersection points. Um, so X0 is from LD to L0, and XI is in LI minus one intersect LI. And you consider maps from polygons in R D plus one to M with those boundary data. And then you, you compactify that moduli space in, in the way I'm talking about here. You include these degenerate configurations um, and we're allowing the conformal structure, the complex structure on the domain to vary. So what you actually get is you get a moduli space. Um, you actually get a moduli, maybe it's important to say, you get a moduli space of maps and that moduli space of maps actually itself has a morphism to the associohedron um, because you just forget the map and remember only the structure of the domain. So, um, right, if you've studied gromov witten theory, you know this is like the moduli space of stable maps, maps to the Boolean monthly space. I mean, it's the same thing. Okay. So you also need to include in this the Fleur breaking, that's where a bygone breaks off, and the disk breaking. Okay. So you, you, you throw in everything that can possibly happen. Um, and then you get a compactification. So, so it's a theorem, uh, maybe I should say there's some kind of theorem here that if you throw in these configurations, you do get something compact. That's saying that this is a complete list of all the possible degenerations that can occur. There's not some other thing that um, we're considering here. Okay. Well, I guess actually, oh, I'm sorry. I, so you also, I guess, should include um, disk bubbling, uh, okay, bubbling in the interior. Okay, so I did omit something um, because it doesn't really affect what I want to do, but you do actually have to also consider um, sphere bubbling in the interior of the curve. Okay, maybe, I, I promised I would say every issue, so I did, not, I did omit that from the slides, but you do also have to consider a, a bubbling where a compact Riemann surface bubbles off in the interior. Okay, I did, that's not on the slides. You do have to throw that in. Um, I'm going to down, I'm going to sort of, uh, uh, suppress that issue, uh, for this, for the rest of this talk. Okay. Um, there's another thing, um, to say, uh, this, this, so one theorem is that this is a complete list of the degenerations. Um, there's actually, you need the converse theorem, which says that every degenerate configuration actually appears in the boundary of the, of the kind of the main stratum. That's called the gluing theorem. Um, that's actually a very difficult uh, technical point. That's not really like, um, it's not really classical partial differential equations analysis. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's something that was developed, I think starting in the 1980s um, with people studying moduli spaces of monopoles and instantons and that sort of thing. I mean, so that's actually a pretty recent um, idea. Okay. But anyway, this compactification is what we're gonna use to define um, the Fukai category. All right, let's see. Okay, no questions. Are there any, so this is one, is there any qu other questions at this point? Does anyone have others? Okay. All right, so let's do an example. Let's use this to do something algebraic. Okay, so let's talk about the Fleur cohomology. So what is that? That's sort of, I focus on just the case where I have two Lagrangians, okay? So I have L0 and L1, just two Lagrangians, and I wanna define some algebraic structure associated to these two Lagrangians. So um, CFL0, L1, remember that's just the, um, the vector space whose basis are the intersection points. Okay, and I, that's supposed to be, I said, I've said somehow that that's supposed to be a chain complex. Well, um, so it should have a boundary map. I mean, right, it's supposed to be a complex, it should have a boundary map. Where's that boundary map gonna come from? Well, 
so what I want to do is I want to count the bygones. So that's the first idea. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's consider that bygone problem, the problem of finding, you know, holomorphic maps with this structure, the structure in this picture. So the domain is a disk with two boundary punctures. One boundary component maps to L0, the other boundary component maps to L1. Um, one of the punctures is asymptotic to X, the other puncture is asymptotic to Y. So I consider that problem. Okay, and now I, I'm going to assume that the thing kind of works, that okay, I can make that moduli space into a smooth manifold. Um, well, okay, and I, I want to now count things, although at this point, and one of the issues comes back, which is that the domain here, which is a, a disk with two boundary punctures, actually has a positive dimensional automorphism group. The automorphism group is actually R, which you could think of as kind of shifting. Um, so the, the R action, by the way, it's a, well, what is it? There's a Mobius transformation on the disk with two boundary punctures that kind of uh, sort of repels from one of the punctures and attracts to the other puncture. Um, forget, I forget what kind of what the name for that kind of element of SL2R is, but you know it's something like that. Um, so I actually need to divide by that action. So I'm actually going to consider the the I'm going to sort of quotient by the automorphisms of the domain, and then I want to count what are called the rigid strips. So it's possible that this moduli space of strips um, has multiple components of different dimensions. Well, for, let's the simplest thing to do is to say, okay, we're gonna throw out the higher dimensional components and only look at the zero dimensional components and we're gonna count them. We're just gonna see how many points are in that space. Of course, we're also gonna, so eventually we're also gonna associate some signs to that, which I've deferred, but let's you know throw those in. And then so N, X, Y, is going to be the count of rigid modulo R strips. It's some number. And then I say that number is the matrix element of the differential joining X to Y. That's what this equation here means. So, so the, the count of strips is the matrix element of this operator. And that's what I take for the definition. OK, so that is the Fleur differential on the um, Fleur cohomology. Okay, there and now again, there's a possible issue, um, which is it's possible that you could have infinitely many of these things. Um, that there could be infinitely many strips. I mean, how do I know there's only finitely many? Well, <clears throat> there's then you have to do something. You can actually handle that using um, by changing the coefficient field uh, to something called the Novikov field. Basically, the idea is that there may be infinitely many terms in the operation. But there's only finitely many um, where the geometric area of the curve is less than a given bound. And so then you sort of filter the curves by their area and uh, take, in, take, you know, sort of uh, keep track of that area by a formal variable and th that solves that problem. So actually, th that's not really that bad of a problem. But I'm just going to pretend that that doesn't happen for this stuff. Okay. Okay. So. <coughs> I've swept you know, the dimension under the rug. I've swept the signs under the rug, but I want to tell you why d squared is zero, right? Why is this a differential? And that has to do with this compactification um, ish, uh, that we've been talking about. That's the reason why I went through all the business of compactification is because I want to be use that to prove relations. Okay, so the idea here is that if you take, what happens when you take d squared? <clears throat> well, what you're gonna count um, if you think about it, you're going to count pairs of configurations. You're going to count pairs of strips. Um, but the idea is that now, why would that be zero? Why would the count of the pairs of strips be zero? I mean, you know, the strips, there's plenty of strips. Why would the count of pairs be zero? Well, you do have to take into account the signs here. Um, and what happens is that the set of pairs of strips is actually the boundary of the set of strips of one higher dimension. So, you know, you, you take these zero dimensional components, you take pairs of, of things in the zero dimensional component. That's the boundary of the one dimensional component. That's of, of a different problem. So, <laughs> so here's the, like, you have to see the picture to see how it works. So here is a strip that joins X and Y. So I have two curves, two Lagrangians. Here's a strip that joins X to Y. And this strip, <coughs> excuse me. This strip 
has, um, actually it has dimension one. So the component of the moduli space that contains this strip is one dimensional. Um, if you were following very closely, you know how to predict that. You know that that's because there's an interior angle here, which is greater than pi. Um, okay, good. So what that means is that this strip can move in a family and it can degenerate. Okay, so what it means is, for example, a slit could form along the, the vertical line and then it breaks into two bygones. So this point down here, I'll call that P. So I have a bygone that joins X to P and then a bygone that joins P to Y. So this last term, this term here on the upper left, that's a term in D squared because I do D from X to P and then I do D from P to Y. So that's a term in D squared. But this same curve can degenerate in a different way because the slit could form along the other Lagrangian. So here this slit forms and then it splits this way. So here I have a bygone from X to Q and a bygone from Q to Y. So in fact, this, this one dimensional moduli space, it is a cobordism that pairs up these two configurations. Oops. So what actually happens is that I look at all of these configurations of pairs of strips, like here's one pair of strips, X goes to P goes to Y. Here's another pair of strips, X goes to Q goes to Y. Those are two different pairs of strips, but those two things are themselves paired up by this one dimensional moduli space. So this tells me that, this, this gives me a pairing on the actual terms in D squared. So I look at all the terms in D squared and they all pair up. And I have to just prove, I have to just verify that they always occur with opposite signs. And okay, once you do that, you see, oh, I paired up all the terms. They all occur with opposite signs. Um, so it's zero. Okay, that's the argument you use to prove an equation like d squared equals zero. Okay, so this, so there you go. <laughs> Let's see, I think I have a question. Hyperbolic Mobius transformation. Okay, thank you. That's the answer to what is the automorphisms of the disk with two uh, boundary punctures. Okay. Okay, so that's how you prove d squared is zero. Now, you'll notice that this proof actually has a, um, there's something a little bit wrong with it because, um, so the thing that could happen is that you could have other strata in the compactification. So d squared is zero unless we have disks with boundary on L. So in fact, that doesn't happen exactly in this picture, but that's more like, let me see this picture. Let me go back, oops this picture. So if this phenomenon happens, that would actually spoil d squared equals zero. So this phenomenon right here, because yeah, so this phenomenon spoils d squared equals zero. Um, okay, so d squared equals zero, unless we have disk with boundary on Li. In this case, um, you have to do something. So, one, so there's two options. Either you come up with a hypothesis that excludes this or you just deal with it. So in fact, this disk phenomenon actually cannot happen in the exact situation. That's one of the benefits of the exact situation. Remember I defined that last time. Um, so one of the benefits of the exact situation is that disk bubbling cannot happen. Um, and the reason is the following. So if you take a holomorphic disk and you integrate the symplectic form over it, you always get a positive number. I mean, it's not a constant map, you get a positive number. Um, that follows from the fact that the complex structure was chosen to be compatible with the symplectic form. So, so, the, so the, the omega area of a disk has to be positive, but if your symplectic form is exact, so it's D theta and your Lagrangian is exact, so theta restricted to L is the differential of a function, then there's a quick argument that shows that the area of a disk has to be zero, which is here. So, you know, integral of omega over the disk is integral of d theta, which is the integral of theta over the boundary of the disk. But then theta is df, so it's the integral of df over the boundary, which is the integral of f over the double boundary of the disk, but the double boundary is zero. So there you go. Um, so an exact situation is, so that's one really nice thing about the exact situation is that you don't have to worry about this. So this D squared will be zero in the exact situation. Okay, otherwise, 
um, you do actually have to deal with these disks. And, and the point is, it's not just, you, you can't really necessarily get rid of them always. So you have to sometimes just deal with them and you have to just incorporate them into the algebraic structure. So that's what's called a curved A infinity structure. So we would get curved A infinity category. Um, what that means is that in addition to the operations M1, M2, M3, et cetera, you also have M0. And M0 is an operation that takes no inputs. <laughs> and it has an output um, in the, the, Fleur, the chain complex associated to a single Lagrangian. OK. So you, so you could do that, um, you know, and you do still get a good structure. Um, right. What, so it's, it's kind of a curvature because the equation looks something like d squared is the commutator with m0. That's what, what you get. So, OK. So it's like, so, so the m0 is like the curvature. If you thought of d as a connection, then m0 is the curvature of that connection. Um, so, but we'll just assume for the rest of this slides that there's no disk. This doesn't happen. OK. Let's see. So I'm a bit over time. So maybe I'll just finish this. Fleur this, is the, this will be the last slide, and then I'll pick up with this next time. But so this lets us define the Fleur cohomology. So I'm going to say I'm assuming that this disk problem doesn't arise. So I have a differential. And the cohomology of that complex is uh, the Fleur cohomology of the pair L0, L1. Um, what's good about that? Um, well, it's invariant under Hamiltonian deformations of Li. So that's good. So Hamilton, so there's certain diffeomorphisms you can apply that don't change the answer. Um, and if L1 and L2 are not transverse, um, we're going to use that invariance to, to perturb them so that we can define this. So a nice example, which goes back to you know, Fleur, his original work, is that if you take the zero section in the cotangent bundle <coughs> of a compact manifold Q, the Fleur homology of that zero section with itself is just the classical cohomology of Q. OK. So and let's see, just in the interest of time, I think I'll stop there. And then I'll do the last two sections of this set of slides on Monday. And then there'll actually be a third set of slides where I uh, explain some examples. OK. Great. Thank you very much. Let's see. Thank you very much, um, James. Um, so I think there's already questions um, starting in the chat. Yeah. Uh, for you. <laughs> yeah. So, do you need Q compact for this last thing? Yes. Yes, that was my intention. Let's see other questions. Yeah. Relations to open string field theory from Jim Stashev. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, yeah. I actually, I don't, I don't know um, how to. Um, I don't. I, I'm actually. I'm, I'm, I'm very fuzzy on what open string field theory actually is. Um, as many of us. <laughs> um, I'm so I'm sorry. I mean, I think of this as an open string theory. I think of this Fukai category as an open string theory with D brains. So these Lagrangians are D brains. And ah, this is okay. the, um, so the Lagrangians are D brains and this holomorphic. So the, what is it? How do you say this? It's it's like a lingo. It's like a language thing. But the Lagrangians are the Dirichlet brains. This CF L zero L one. That's the Hilbert space associated to the pair of Lagrangians, uh, the pair of boundary conditions. And then this these MKs are the amplitudes for. Well, I don't know. It's the amplitude for. <laughs> I mean, each intersection point is a state, and then the amplitude for some states going to another final state is this holomorphic discount. <laughs> Good. Thank yeah. you. Oh, sure. Yeah. Are there any other questions for James? You can just unmute yourself to ask them. You don't have to ask in the chat. Hi, James. Um, for the people who are not on the geometric or in the physics yeah. uh, field, so why? I mean, the symplectic geometry is beautiful. Why do we first add the complex structure, and why? What's the motivation of accounting of the disks? Great question. So, why do we introduce the complex structure, and what is the motivation for counting the disks? Well, let's see. Why do we introduce the complex structure? Well. 
just well, I mean, we have to thank uh, you know Mike Mikhail Gromov for telling us to do that. I mean, that was you know. So there's a 1985 paper by Gromov, pseudo holomorphic curves in symplectic manifolds, and he says, "Hey, look, a symplectic manifold always admits a compatible envelope complex structure." So yeah, it's it's really beautiful. I mean, it's really it's really magical. Yeah. Um, the point is that you look at this problem and you're like, this is nonsense. Like, why would you, like, we understand complex manifolds. This would be a silly theory, um, but it's not a silly theory. I mean, that's what Gromov understood. I, I mean, because uh, there's a lot of things that kind of line up very nicely. Um, mm -hmm. So one thing is that you have, a almost, you have an almost complex structure, but it's not integrable. That means that you don't have holomorphic functions. So actually this thing is not a complex manifold. There's no local holomorphic functions. Okay. The reason for that is because it's, it's like standard PD things. Like um, if you think about it, if you want to have a holomorphic function on an almost complex manifold, it needs to satisfy a set of cauchy riemann equations. But you understand okay. like there's one function and there's n equations where n is the complex dimension. So that's an overdetermined system. So it just doesn't work unless the equations are compatible and, the, and there's an integrability condition. However, if you consider maps from a Riemann surface to an almost complex manifold, it, it does work. It's, it's determined because you have n functions and n equations. So somehow the, the, the exact thing that works is if you consider maps from a Riemann surface to an almost complex manifold. Um, Saying it that way makes it seem like it's something about almost complex manifolds, but Gromov also understood that the symplectic form controls the moduli spaces. Basically, um, if you have just an almost complex manifold, you can consider holomorphic maps from a Riemann surface to it. But those moduli spaces are actually can be really wild. Um, but if you have the symplectic form that controls the area of the holomorphic curves and it proves this theorem that these are the only degenerations that can occur. If you don't have the symplectic form, very wild degenerations can occur. Um, so yeah, that, that's how you kind of motivate this thing. Um, yeah, and then Fleur brought in, Fleur came along and he sort of showed that this is also connected to Morse theory on infinite dimensional spaces. Um, so, you know, then it, then it's kind of got going, yeah. I have heard about the sky category on that with the five minutes of a definition of Kaya category for over the last 20 years, I never understood the motivation. <laughs> but I really appreciate you explaining why you were yeah. doing all these punctual points on this. What the okay, yeah, good. Okay, Thank you. Okay, any, any more questions for James? Oh, I think one just got typed in the chat. Let me see. Is it possible to consider singular Lagrangians? Um, yes, but you know that. Well, yeah, that introduces a new, you know, bag of bag of worms. I mean, a new how, new can of worms. What's the? I don't even. What's the idiom? <laughs> that introduces a lot of new um, problems. Immersed Lagrangians are probably the first thing to consider. So, and there's a lot of, there is a lot of literature considering those. So that's where your Lagrangian is allowed to intersect itself. Um, but it's still uh, given by a map from a smooth manifold an immersion of a smooth manifold into your manifold, excuse me. That's probably the nicest case where you, the Lagrangian is singular, but um, it's immersed. If you have other singular Lagrangians, um, well, actually, maybe talk about that in the third the third lecture. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, it, it gets kind of uh, it gets kind of complicated. But there are places. There are there is a place for singular Lagrangians in uh, symplectic in this Fukai category, but it's um, it's not so technical. It's not so easy. Yeah. Okay, and um, James, are you able to join us in Gather today? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so maybe we can leave any further questions um, to Gather Town. All right. Um, and let's thank James again for his, his lovely talk. Thank you. And then I hope to see you all on Gather Town. I'll just put the link in the chat. Mm -hmm.
Um, if you have any problems using it, um, just try to send me an email and I can.